There is no other way to say this. The Vikings are a repugnant, atrocious, historically bad defense. They have now allowed 400 plus yards in five straight games, and as of today are 32nd in pass defense, 32nd in total yardage given up, and somehow, by the grace of God, only 24th in points allowed per game. There are a lot of different reasons that we can point to for why Minnesota is as bad as they are, but seeing as this is a tape study channel and uh, I'm not super great at math, we're just going to stick to the three main things that we can see wrong on tape when it comes to schematics and techniques and fundamentals and all that kind of stuff. Reason number one, they are painfully predictable in terms of schematic tendencies and they are super easy to game plan for. Reason number two, their communication skills, especially in the secondary, are non-existent, so they bust coverages constantly, and I mean constantly. And reason number three, they just don't have the right guys to run what they think they want to run schematically, which is both a front office problem and a coaching problem at the same time, but we'll touch on both anyway. So without further ado, if you're a Vikings fan, uh, first things first, I highly Highly recommend you go get yourself a drink for this next part because uh, Lord knows you might need it. It's it's a little bit horrific, but just give me 15, 20 minutes and I promise we will get through this together. The primary thing you need to know about how the Vikings defense operates is that they are pretty one dimensional ish when it comes to how they structure their coverages. For starters, they damn near refuse to call man coverage at all. They only call cover one about 10.9% of the time, which is 30th in the NFL. And they don't really call a whole lot of cover three either. They're 29th in that coverage at about 22.4%. So on the whole, they tend to not use middle field closed coverages, meaning coverages with one deep safety closing down the middle of the field. What they do love to call, however, is quarter-quarter half coverages. Most of you probably know that as cover six, where on one side of the field it's quarters, and then on the other side of the field it's cover two, so it's quarter-quarter half field zone. They lead the league in that, calling it a whopping 28% of the time, which is the most I have ever seen that called by far, and they supplement it with a healthy dose of regular old match quarters coverage on top of that, and of course all the variations of quarters within that family. For reference, they call quarters 11th most in the NFL. Now, from a top-level view, it's not necessarily a bad thing to major in zone coverage of various types, but I do think it's bad that they've become so predictable with their favorite coverages that teams pretty much specifically game plan around them at this point. Everybody and their mother knows the types of calls Ed Donatel relies on, and unfortunately for the Vikings, those calls have a long, long list of ways to beat them. As an example, let's look at this play from about a minute left to go in the first half of the Lions game that just happened last weekend. It's an obvious passing situation, so Detroit expects the Vikings to be in their staple quarter-quarter half defense, and you can see with the distribution of the Lions receiving threats that they also knew what kind of quarter-quarter half to expect. You see, there's multiple ways to call this style of coverage. You could put the half field safety to the wide side of the field and play quarters to the boundary, or you could play quarters to the wide side and put your half field safety to the boundary and play cover two in that kind of reduced space. You can also designate it by passing strength of the offense, which is just the side that has more receivers on it. So you could play quarters to passing strength or cover two to passing strength, whichever one you feel more comfortable with. There's a lot of different ways to mix up your calls and define which side is which, and it's all matchup based mostly, but Detroit has a pretty good idea here that the Vikings are actually calling cover two to the boundary based on the alignment of the two different outside cornerbacks. If we roll the play from the very, very beginning where Jared Goff first gets set, you can see him peek to his right and then he peeks to his left. And in that moment, he's looking at the alignment of Patrick Peterson and Duke Shelley. Peterson is about eight yards off and outside leverage, while Shelley is only about four yards off. Which of these two guys do you think is playing a flat zone in cover two, and which do you think is going to be zoning off in quarters? Sometimes it really is that simple, and they are telling Goff right now what defense they're in. It's quarters to the field, cover two to the boundary. Receiver distribution be damned, it does not matter at all here, that's just what it is. Goff then gives a little hard count in his cadence just to make sure that there's no blitz, which there isn't, and then he brings Amon Ross St. Brown in motion so that he can run this seam route up the middle off a switch release. This right here is the perfect call against this coverage because you know that these two quarters defenders are going to be frozen a little bit backside because they have to account for these two receiving threats if they both go vertical, that's how quarters works, so they can't float to the middle of the field immediately. 
And then on the front side, again, this half field safety, Josh Metellus is completely boned as well. It would not matter if this was Harrison Smith in the game instead. Regardless, he's in a no win situation here schematically because he can't just go over to the middle of the field and midpoint these two receivers. He has to play over the top of the high seven route first in this smash concept, because if he lets that go and he only takes the seam, then it's probably a touchdown anyway. He has to stay outside here. So there is nobody to cover St. Brown going right up the middle seam other than maybe linebacker Eric Kendricks. Theoretically, he could turn and burn with that. But I mean, in this stage of his career, even if he did pick it up and match that vertically to help out the safety, I don't really expect him to run with perhaps an all pro caliber receiver out there anyway. So you can see the bind that Lions offensive coordinator Ben Johnson put Ed Donatel into here. If your best option at stopping the best route that is meant to bust your coverage is Eric Kendricks or maybe Jordan Hicks against Amon Ross St. Brown of all people, you're kind of fucked. You don't have a real answer here. And obviously on this play, they didn't have any answer at all. And it was just a free chunk of 25 yards for Detroit to start off their drive. These kinds of situations happen constantly to Minnesota's defense, where it's very obvious that the offense knows what coverage they're going to call and they punish it accordingly. Hell, there was another situation literally in the very next quarter against Detroit that was arguably even worse than the last one. It was second and 10 just across midfield for the Lions. And I'm going to freeze this image right here because this should show you everything you need to see. And not going to lie, it's pretty awful. You have, again, Amon Ross St. Brown in the slot, Pro Bowl receiver, at least Pro Bowl caliber receiver, looking directly at Zadarius Smith about to try to cover him in space. You might be wondering how something like this even happens. And believe me, the answer is dumber than you think. The Lions came out in 21 personnel, right? So there's a fullback on the field and a tight end and only two receivers and a running back in the backfield, of course. But rather than lining up in, say, an I formation or something like that, they spread everybody out and they put the fullback and the tight end wide and the receivers in both slots. If the offense lines up like this, you literally cannot hide what you're doing on defense if you're matched up with base personnel, especially against 21 personnel from the offense. The matchups are way too obvious, and offenses sometimes line up this way on purpose from these heavier personnel groupings because it just makes it that much easier for defenses to uh, show their hand, so to speak. The Patriots did this shit all the time, and defensive coordinators hated it. There's no nickel on the field to handle St. Brown in the slot, and for whatever reason, they don't check into man coverage like cover one just to make sure they at least get some corner matched up on him. Remember when I said they actively despise man coverage up there in Minneapolis? And so because their only check against this look is apparently playing quarter quarter half coverage again, that's how you end up with situations like this one where a 30 year old 280 pound pass rusher is zone dropping and fighting for his fucking life out there in space against the reincarnation of Wes Welker. This is nauseatingly incompetent defense. It would be one thing if they just didn't have the personnel, that would be understandable. But Zedaria Smith is a great player. He's a fantastic edge rusher when you're allowing him to actually just play edge. There should be no scenario where he's asked to zone drop in space and cover wide receivers. But here we are because this is perhaps the least adaptable, least creative defense in the entire league. And trust me, that is saying a lot. Beyond just being predictable and incredibly easy to game plan for, however, the Vikings defense is also borderline hilariously prone to busting coverages and miscommunications in general. There is a concerningly large number of examples to pick from, but I have a very, very special one in mind that I'm going to break down to illustrate just how bad some of these mistakes are. But first, before I do that, I want to take a quick second to thank our sponsor this week for helping to make this extremely frustrating show possible in the first place, Factor. You guys know them and love them by now because they've been a staunch supporter of this channel and what we're trying to build here. But just in case you're new to the show, Factor makes fresh, never frozen meals that are delivered right to your door. And most importantly of all, they are really tasty. Shockingly tasty for microwavable meals, actually. All Factor meals arrive pre-prepared and ready to eat in just two minutes, which is perfect for busy days where you don't really have time to cook and you just need to eat something. Their menus are also updated weekly and include 34 meals and 36 plus add-on options like their wonderful juices and snacks and plant-based smoothies. 
You can even choose your favorite meals or let Factor craft your order based on your taste preferences and meal history. For example, this week's delivery for me was Santa Fe green chili beef brisket, the Baja shrimp, the spicy peanut grilled chicken, and the roasted red pepper Parmesan chicken, and all of them were just fantastic. So if you're looking for quick food options to get you through a busy day, I think Factor is definitely worth giving it a try just to see if you like it because nothing you get from the grocery store, at least in all the frozen food aisle, will be this tasty and this fresh. And if you do decide you want to try it out, by the way, you can use my promo code by heading to go.factor75.com slash filmroom60 and use code filmroom60 to get 60% off your first Factor box. Thank you again to Factor for sponsoring this week's show. And with that, let's get back to it. All right, let's talk busted coverages. There have been very few Vikings games this year where they did not at least one time catastrophically bust a coverage, as in completely let some receiver go free deep down the field with nobody carrying them whatsoever. And I don't know why they bust so much. I, I have no clue what causes all of these communication problems. All I do know is that they happen and they happen a lot. Perhaps my favorite, or I guess technically least favorite example of one of these busts though, was not actually a receiver running uncovered deep down the field like usual, but rather a running back that nobody decided to pick up in the flat and then easily scored a long touchdown after the catch, of course referring to Tony Pollard. The Cowboys game was unequivocally the low point in Minnesota's season so far. They lost 40 to three after all, and this play was probably the low point of that low point. So here's how it happened. Dallas is in a four strong look here, meaning there are four eligible receivers, including the running back lined up to the strong side. And Minnesota is in a look that is very similar to what Nick Saban calls stubby coverage or what Gary Patterson calls special, but it's slightly different. And I consulted with my mentor on this to get advice. That's Coach Vass. If you're familiar with him and his YouTube channel, he's a brilliant football mind and he helps me out with understanding defensive calls like this one that are uh, really nuanced to say the least. So go check him out. But anyway, I consulted with him and this coverage is not special. It's a variation that he calls special keep or for the folks that speak Sabanese, I guess you'd call it stubby keep. And here's how it works. The field side corner is inside leveraged in man coverage. This is a Meg call, meaning man everywhere he goes. And then this three over two triangle on the number two and the number three receiver is very similar to a regular special or stubby call, but it's not quite the same. This is called special keep because this linebacker, Eric Kendricks, will keep walling off the number three receiver down the field. He's not going to let him go and pass off to the safety. And meanwhile, the nickel will take all of number two vertical and outside. So basically number two and number three will be carried vertical. And the safety is not solely dedicated to number three, like in a normal special call. He's midpointing between number two and number three and will bracket whichever one goes vertical. Now, what throws a wrench into this coverage is the fact that Dallas, again, is in a four strong look. If this running back Pollard was lined up on the weak side, like most trip sets that you're used to seeing, the Mike linebacker Jordan Hicks would just match him to the flat and everything would play out like normal. But because Pollard is on the strong side and has a massive leverage advantage with that head start against Hicks if he releases fast to the flat, something kind of has to be changed here. They need to make a check pre-snap to help themselves out of this leverage problem. And the most common check that you're going to see against any four strong look from any sort of coverage in the stubby or special match quarters family is that you'll make what's known as a push call and now have Eric Kendricks match Pollard to the flat because he has better leverage while Hicks will then wall and carry the number three vertical with that safety help over the top, of course. That is what they should be doing here, and they even do that down at the high school level, but for whatever reason, they just didn't. As Pollard released to the flat, Kendricks carried the number three, the nickel carried the number two, like he's supposed to, and Hicks must have thought that somebody was going to push out to Pollard, but nobody was there. It was just a complete breakdown in assignment, and from that point, Dak Prescott just took the free money that this defense was willing to give him, and he threw it to Tony. And with Pollard's sheer explosiveness after the catch, they really had no shot at stopping him. Also, by the way, side note, shout out to Dalton Schultz for picking up this block in space. That was super clutch and another big reason why this play worked. But beyond that, the main reason this catch went for six is because of the rampant communication issues in this defense. They either have the checks to deal with these alignment issues and they don't use them, or they just don't have the checks, period. Either one of those options is bad. And truthfully, I don't know which one is worse. 
and I'm not a coach, so I don't know how to fix it either. It's just really, really hard to watch because all these guys should be a lot better than they are. Now, last but certainly not least, point number three today is touching on something that might also be painfully obvious to many of you, but it's still the elephant in the room, so we have to address it at some point. The Vikings personnel, especially, again, in the secondary, is just not suited for this system. Patrick Peterson has been mostly fine, but beyond him, I mean, Cam Bynum has been a straight-up liability at times. Harrison Smith, even when healthy, has definitely lost a step or two, even though he's still a pretty good player overall. But Cam Dantzler, Duke Shelley, and Shannon Sullivan are quite possibly the most inconsistent corners in the NFL, and that is being generous. But to me, truthfully, a lot of the coverage struggles of these DBs have come down to the style they are being asked to play and the techniques they are being asked to use. Ed Donatel, perhaps because they play so much zone and zone match coverage, has all of these DBs playing way off in space pretty much at all times, and most of these guys are just not built for that. They don't have the feet for it, they don't have the hips for it, and they don't have the burst for it. It's just not their game. And as an example, from a biomechanical standpoint, it is exceptionally hard for a bigger and or older defensive back to play in space full speed against really fast receivers without being caught flat-footed. You have to be an utterly insane athlete to make that work at that size, like J.C. Horn or Jalen Ramsey in his prime or Patrick Sertan. But quite frankly, none of these DBs are even close to being that kind of athlete right now. For their own sake, they need to be in what's called a soft shoe press alignment, kind of like what you used to see Richard Sherman and Aqib Tlaib and Charles Tillman do, where they can put their physicality and size and length to use. Because guys like Patrick Peterson and Cam Dantzler are big and lanky, but not exactly explosive. And yet Minnesota is 31st in the league in press coverage snaps, only 215 total between all of their DBs combined. Even when all of their starters are healthy, they still don't really play cover one or cover three and just let them beat people up on the boundary and then funnel receivers inside of their zone help. That's what they used to do under Mike Zimmer, but they don't do it anymore. They just line them up in space and say, okay, go cover all these guys that run four three when you're like eight yards off and in space and flat footed and they can't fucking do it. They just give them free access releases all day long, and it's insane to me that we are four months into the season and they still refuse to change and put their players in position to actually succeed. It's just breathtaking stubbornness at this point, but here we are. Whether this defense giving up actual video game numbers over the last month and a half will inspire any sort of change in scheme for this coaching staff, who knows? But if they do not adjust and if they do not play to their DB's strengths and give them a chance to succeed, this team is going to get bounced out of the playoffs immediately. They will have no shot to compete, not even a little bit. And trust me, if a dumbass like me can see this coming from a mile away, you know the rest of the NFC can see it too. So long story short, I guess, uh, buckle up kids, because when January rolls around, this might somehow get worse. Uh, all right, that'll do it for this week's show. Thank you again for watching. And if you're here this late, by the way, please drop a like for the algorithm. That helps a lot. Or a comment even. I'll take whatever engagement I can get. I am not afraid to play the game. That's just how YouTube is. So, uh, you know, I'm not afraid to beg. I don't have any uh, fancy cocktail B-roll for you this week because I did not do any B-roll while I started making this six months ago. This is what's called a cherry bounce. If you live in North Carolina, you're probably well acquainted with it at this point. It's typically like bourbon or cognac that's been steeping in cherries and baking spices and cinnamon and a shitload of sugar for like six months. You start making it in summer and then you crack it open at, at holiday time and it's highly alcoholic, which I found super necessary this week because the Vikings are a traumatic organization to watch on television. Um, but yeah, make this next year. I'll probably post a recipe in cherry season in summer and, and we'll hit on this again, but it's just, it's wonderful and it makes uh, bad football go away in my brain. So thank you for watching. I'll see you guys next week with something. Love you all. Later. <laughs>